Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about uh, Gnosticism, the ancient Gnostics, related tradition, mysticism, and contemplation. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart. I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Memo. Hello, Jason. Hello, everybody. And we've got uh, an awesome guest and an awesome topic for us all tonight. Um, or, you know, I say tonight, but you could be listening to this in the morning or in the afternoon or, you know, whenever. But I'm calling the show The Dark Side of Meditation. But the name of the book is The Dark Side of Dharma with scholar and PhD candidate Anna Lukaitis. Hello, Anna. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, this is a, a fascinating topic, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it. And did I say your name right? Yes, you did. It's Lutkaitis. <laughs> um, so we're eager to get into this topic, which I think uh, a lot of people out there are not just going to find intellectually stimulating, but because we have a lot of practitioners uh, who engage the show, I think it, it per could possibly even affect their own lives. But before we get into this uh, fascinating, important, incredibly relevant topic that I love, that you love, that the audience loves, we do have to do our commercial for the Patreon. Now, because I hate doing this and it's a horrible thing, I'm going to see how fast I can do it. So we have Jason ready with the stopwatch. Um, ready, ready when you are. Okay, Jason, you actually, you tell me go, and I'll see how fast I can do it. All right, three, two, one, go. Tognos is brought to you by viewers and listeners like you through patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can do as little as a dollar per piece of media uh, per month. You can put a cap on that in case you're worried that we're going to do a whole ton of media. You can also donate uh, through one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. And if you can't help us out financially, we completely understand. You can also tell people about the show. You can like and subscribe on YouTube. You can leave reviews on the podcatcher of your choice. And you can just tell people about the show. Uh, uh, mouth to ear or just take your favorite episode email it to them share the show on your social media so thanks so much for helping us spread the light of gnosis okay done uh 38 seconds 38 seconds okay i'm pretty sure i can beat that next week and you know what <laughs> i realize this time uh it still counts but i wasn't throwing up the uh the links on the screen but i still think that this counts so 38 seconds we'll see how we do next week okay <laughs> the, the horribleness is over now it's time to ascend we <laughs> anna we uh we, we start these the shows off sometimes with impossibly broad questions so I, I know that this that this is a huge topic that you could teach an entire course on but if you could do your best to briefly tell us what meditation and mindfulness is in a and i put these in scare quotes in a quote-unquote western and quote-unquote secular context and if you can tell us a bit where quote unquote secular and quote unquote psychology based mindfulness in the West came from. Okay, yes, it's, it is a huge question. Um, but I, I like to think of secular meditation as just any form of meditation that has been divorced or separated from its religious context. So um, in terms of secular meditation in the West, most people trace it back to John Kabat-Zinn. So in 1979, he created the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. Um, and that was focused around bringing meditation and mindfulness-based techniques into a clinical setting and using it to help people um, initially with chronic pain. Um, then we had in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who um, was the founder of the TM movement. And even though there's a lot of debate around, you know, whether TM is secular or religious, um, it was kind of framed as a secular technique. And that was when we really saw a lot of scientific research happening into meditation um, and the idea of meditation as a relaxation technique um, or something that could be used to um, help people better themselves. Right, exactly. Um, so you mentioned that it was introduced as a relaxation technique. How are the goals of meditation in Eastern religions different from, from secular meditation? Yeah, so this is the really interesting part because in Eastern religious traditions like Buddhism and Hinduism, and again, I'm using inverted commas here because they're such complex traditions, 
But in general, the goal of meditation in those traditions is to transcend the conventional sense of a psychological self. And there's this idea that so much of our suffering comes from this, um, you know, illusion we have that we're this separate um, identity self. So secular meditation, on the other hand, um, is all about the betterment or improvement of the psychological self. So it can be thought of in terms of um, healing or self-improvement or self-care. Um, so it's often focused on symptom relief rather than changes to the well, big changes to the sense of self. Right. Now, it's, it's a generally held assumption, like even by those that don't meditate, um, that, uh, that meditation is uh, at worst harmless, like you're just wasting your time. But I, I would say even from people who don't meditate, uh, who, uh, the, who don't have any connections to these communities, be they religious or be they secular, that, that meditation is, is extremely good for you. And, you know, I hear from a lot of people being like, oh, man, uh, I've only heard good about it. I should try that. So just conversationally in my my day to day life, as well as looking at the news and the media, there seems to be this this, this assumption. It, it now seems to be a baseline assumption uh, in the West. Is there reasons why we may think that this assumption that meditation is extremely good for you no matter what may not be correct? Um, yeah, I mean, I think like anything, meditation has its positives and negatives, and the reality lies somewhere in the middle. So um, I think that when I came into this research, we were probably on the peak of what I would call a mindfulness hype. So there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of positive media surrounding meditation that might have been um, <clears throat> extreme in a sense. And I think the way I think about meditation is that it's probably like a bell curve. So for most people who meditate, they're going to experience benefits. Um, these benefits, like clinical studies show that these benefits are relatively moderate. So it might help conditions like fibromyalgia or anxiety or depression. Um, but then you're going to have people at either end of the curve. And there's going to be some people who experience adverse effects. And there are going to be others who probably experience incredible effects like spontaneous remissions and, you know, all those kind of miracle stories. Um, but I think the media portrayal of meditation has kind of pushed it towards that positive end of the bell curve where it was getting to a point where, you know, you were having stories that meditation is panacea and, you know, it, it's almost a, a miracle cure. And, um, you know, people are thinking that they could stop taking their meditation uh, medication and that it could solve all their problems. Right, right. And can you talk a little bit about what are some of the, the specific adverse effects that some people report and which aren't really talked about in these conversations and this, this hype around meditation and mindfulness? Yeah, so I think the big one is um, psychosis and that can occur for people who um, go on retreats. Again, it's not highly common but it does happen um so i think that's probably the most extreme adverse effect um there have been reports and studies of people experiencing increased depression or anxiety um the other one is re-experiencing of trauma so now there's a whole movement towards mindfulness uh, sorry trauma informed mindfulness um and the idea that you know there are certain populations where you have to tailor meditation specifically for that population. Um, the other really interesting effect is dissociation. So um, this idea that meditation in some people can make them feel that um, the world is not real or that they're not real. So in psychiatry, that would be referred to as uh, depersonalization and derealization. Um, whether or not that is the same thing that's happening in meditation is up for debate, but it's certainly an, an effect that people report. Um, Willoughby Britton, who is probably the, the most well-known researcher who's looking into adverse effects, she has a really amazing paper that um, outlines all these different changes that people have reported in their sense of self. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a lot happening, um, but they're the main ones. Right. And uh, before we move on, I'll, I'll just take a little break there as I as I uh, 
like a train, just steam on through the question <laughs> and just see if, uh, Jason, do you have any comments, uh, any follow-up questions, anything that's sort of tickling your brain uh, uh, from what Anna said so far? Yeah, I will. Uh, uh, so part of part of what you do is when you uh, run that train so far, then you've also laid a lot of tracks, which makes it easier to do follow up questions. So I'm I'm usually happy to let you kind of run along there for a bit. But um, uh, one of the things actually you mentioned, Anna, that, that kind of caught my ear was um, the notion of uh, of uh, mindfulness and meditation geared towards specific populations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like I know for myself, as somebody who uh, lives with ADHD. And anxiety. Um, sometimes, like I've found, uh, particularly when I've got anxiety around a particular, like, uh, specific issue, I actually find my meditation practice much more difficult. Um, yeah. It, like, being alone with those particular thoughts are is actually harder <laughs> than mm -hmm. uh, uh, than distracting myself in uh, with my with my physical attachments, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. At least emotionally harder. Uh, so I guess. Uh, just in that realm of like um, uh, ADHD uh, and like th like sort of circling thought anxiety stuff, are those kind of populations in that in the realm of what you were talking about? Yeah, possibly. Um, and I think that that raises the question of um, you know when when should you be meditating? When might another activity? serve you better so mm. you mentioned distraction and I think for some people sitting with um, an anxious thoughts or traumatic thoughts is useful to an extent but then it you know might end up doing them more harm than good and there are times when it's probably you know better to, to find another activity to do to mm -hmm. you know get out in nature or listen to music or play so I think there's like probably there you know for for some people, there might be this perception that you just have to sit through it, but I don't think that's necessarily um, always the best advice. Mm, interesting. Cool. Well, yeah, and I think even honestly, just hearing that, uh, um, and I've actually heard some of this from from John as well. I want to give him credit there. Is that like just hearing some of this makes me even feel better about my own like uh, nascent meditation journey? <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how um, I mean one of the things that came up for me when I was speaking to people when I was doing my research was this idea around, you know, rigidity in following a prescribed path or the instructions of a teacher and, you know, people not having or feeling that they had the autonomy to, you know, put their hand up and say, actually, this is not working for me at this moment. You know, maybe mm. something else um, would be better. So, I mean, there's lots of interesting issues around authority that, that come up. Um, but I think that, yeah, probably what this research is highlighting is that, um, well, first of all, there are so many different meditation techniques. So mm -hmm. it, it doesn't even, you know, really make sense to, to use the word meditation. Um, and there are it, it just, you know, so many individual differences to take into account. And I think a really good meditation teacher understands that and can tailor meditation um, for their student. Mm. Great. Yeah, the, I suspect that there's, you know, an element of maybe psychic violence is, is a little harsh, but when we have this conception of meditation as a cure-all, as a panacea, and, and you try it and you really commit to it and it's not working for you, but you've heard that it's a panacea, that you actually kind of do some damage to yourself because then you assume that it's you, right? It's yeah. not... <laughs> well, yeah. everybody tells me that that it's, it's it cures the, all these problems that I have, and I've been doing it every day, exactly how I've been told to do it. So th I must be broken. There must be something wrong yeah. with me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you see that a lot with people who have depression and expect that meditation is going to cure depression. Um, and in my book, I talk about a time early in my own meditation journey where I was talking to a teacher and at the time I was suffering from <clears throat> quite bad fibromyalgia and, and chronic pain. And I was just saying to him, you know, why is this not curing my pain? And he's like, you know, meditation is not magic. And at the time that really shocked me um, because I think I was so steeped in this narrative of, of meditation being this panacea and um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, and 
Uh, it's it's another huge issue uh, that I know you touch on in your work, and you already mentioned how many different techniques are labeled as meditation. I mean, you, you said that already in the interview, but there's like the variety can be shocking and to think that they're all lumped under the same heading. So from everything from washing your breath to very elaborate imaginative uh, visualizations. <laughs> um, where there's almost no similarities between these techniques. Uh, but we just classify it all uh, under meditation. And, and I think you mentioned the, in regards to relaxation, uh, which is one of the primary applications of meditation in the West, that you know some, some science, some studies, some research has, has actually shown that some techniques will do the opposite of, of settling you down, of relaxation. <laughs> you know, they'll yeah. get you fired up. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. And even techniques that are that you know tend to be relaxing in small doses can then be stimulating in higher doses. So again, I think it's Willoughby Britton um, and Jared Lindall who have a paper um, that talks about oh, it's called "Awakening is is not a metaphor." It's the best title, um, and it, it just talks about how you know initially small doses of mindfulness. Um, might induce relaxation but then if you're doing it for a prolonged period it can actually be very stimulating um, and this is something that people might experience on retreat like their inability to fall asleep and they're some of the factors that might affect people um, if they're prone to psychosis um, that lack of sleep um, overstimulation that's po a possible mechanism behind that yeah for sure and you know getting over some of those cliches i've never done uh, a meditation retreat where afterwards I haven't gotten a huge fight with my wife <laughs> that, that I usually started and that was that was usually entirely my fault because it's uh, uh, I, I'm often wound up afterwards <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <Right>? interesting. <laughs> yeah I've also experienced that uh, uh, you know doing longer retreats and, and having that that lack of sleep of sort of in, in a way being wound up by the by the meditation and uh, thankfully no psychosis but uh, and I don't want to pick on any particular traditions or particular styles of retreat but uh you know i i've done the the infamous 12 day silent wanky retreat um mm -hmm. and i don't know i've every every time that that one is run there seems to be people having um some sort of severe mental break <laughs> like mm. it's, it's a fantastic retreat in many ways in in my opinion but just uh and, and this is just anecdotally uh that um uh because it, the, doing that retreat is quite popular in, in the city that i live in so but i know just going myself and talking to people afterwards a cohort that i that i went with you know people going home early people having really bad symptoms and just talking to people and sort of everybody has a story and that's a particularly sort of long and brutal meditation retreat that that a lot of people I, I don't know about the majority but i would definitely say a lot of people do as their introduction to meditation <laughs> yeah which which is so interesting because if you look at the um and you know this is what my book essentially talks about like i said that one of the reasons that adverse effects have been ignored is because we have this disconnection from the literature and the religious traditions that um you know talks about all of these factors that are important to a meditation practice and one of those factors is preparation so um, most people in, in a religious tradition will go through a period of intense preparation before they start meditating whereas in the west yeah we have retreats where anyone can kind of just sign up and i think you're right i think it's pretty it's an intense experience for for a beginner to go straight into a 10 or 12 day silent retreat yeah yeah exactly the uh you mentioned sorry. some of the oh sorry go ahead jason Sorry, yeah, just just to dive in there too. Like one thing this also kind of reminds me of is um, uh, one thing that uh, uh, John's heard me talk about in some of our uh, of our group sessions in the in the Gnostic group stuff has been um, how to remember that the person who cut you off in traffic is also connected to the light of gnosis. You know, um, and uh, what, the reason I bring this up is that I one thing I find is that like it's easy to sort of philosophically understand it in the quiet and privacy of of your tradition and in a space, but then to uh, to remember it when you're not there, and that's kind of connected to I think it sounds to me like it's connected to a thing that, the thing that uh, John mentioned about um, getting in a fight as soon as you get home because you've 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 spent all of this time deeply connected to something, mm. and then now you have to deal with with all the minor inconveniences of not of not being directly connected to everything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, yeah. And so it's like yeah, the, just that that 
especially if the tradition that you're working in isn't giving you the tools to bridge those. That's yeah. kind of where I was going. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, there definitely needs to be um, some form of support or um, integration, I think. And, um, you know, and that's another issue with some of these retreats is that afterwards there isn't always a community that the meditator can connect with and the teacher's not always available um, for questions afterwards. So people will find that they're navigating this territory by themselves. Yeah. Actually, Jason, you, you uh, your thoughts on, on the topic uh, relate to, to one of the questions, so I'll, I'll ask it next, which is um, actually some of, some of the, the bad side effects of having really positive um, meditation experiences like Jason was talking about, having that sense of being connected to everything and what mm. happens next. So uh, Anna, wh what is quote unquote the dark night of the soul? And, and why does this term pop up in relation to meditation and, and meditation in the West? Yeah, th this is such an interesting question. Um, so the dark night of the soul generally refers to a poem um, by St. John of the Cross, who is a, a, a mystic. Um, and it's describing the, the difficult journey of the soul in its quest to reach mystical union with God. Um, and so this is a journey that often involves a lot of challenges and periods of, um, you know, feeling isolated and, and spiritual suffering. Um, and it's interesting how this term got incorporated into modern Buddhism. Um, and I want to uh, my papers looks at this and traces the the use of the term back to Jack Cornfield, you might know, who's a um, Vipassana meditation teacher. And he wrote a book called A Path with Heart. Um, and then another teacher um, or meditation expert, I would say, he's not actually a teacher, but Daniel Ingram, who wrote Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. So both Jack and Daniel um, kind of appropriated the term to refer to um, a, a stage on the path, um, which is called the the Dukkananas. So it's um, knowledges of suffering and it's a stage in the Theravada tradition, it's a stage that people go through on the path to enlightenment. And it's characterized by all these really difficult, challenging emotions, like, you know, extreme fear and terror, misery, disgust. Um, and so Jack and Daniel kind of use the term dark night to refer to that. Um, then, We've got other, do you want me to go into other yeah, please. Um, yeah, uses of the term? Okay, so then you've got Shinzen Young, who is another well-known meditation teacher. So he says the dark night um, doesn't really refer to the Dukkananas, but instead he uses the term to describe what he calls insight gone wrong. So he says that it's it can be um, described as a misinterpretation of the insight into non-self and non-world. Um, and this corresponds with what um, psychiatry might refer to as derealization and depersonalization. So it's a feeling that the self and the world are not real. Um, so Shinzen calls this enlightenment's evil twin. And he says that, you know, this can happen if, if someone has a misinterpretation of these insights. Um, and then the final use of the term dark night in modern Buddhism or modern Western Buddhism um, I trace back to Willoughby Britton's research. So she's the researcher who looks at meditation adverse effects and, you know, quite her whole career is dedicated to it. And when she started um, researching adverse effects, her project was actually called the Dark Knight Project. Um, mm. And it's since been renamed to the Varieties of Contemplative Experience. But um, I, I feel like, um, well, I argue that this term dark night kind of became a bit of a meme in in modern western buddhism and for a while people were using it to refer to all different things um and yeah i think if you look at specific teachers specific traditions people are using it to refer to quite different um outcomes right right including the, the sadness that some people feel after having positive uh, meditation experiences, right? Sometimes that's labels dark night of the soul, and but so is, mm. uh, the, I mean, I guess it's it's a really important term to interrogate because it's one that's borrowed from one tradition and put into a new tradition that borrows from a bunch of traditions and everybody who says it means something different by it. Yeah, exactly. So so even I think Jack Cornfield kind of, even though he uses it to refer to the Dukkananas, I think he also, if you read closely, it can refer to that feeling of, 
you know, of sadness after you've had this ecstatic spiritual experience and then you have to go back to normal life. And I think Ken Wilber refers to it as well as a type of abandonment depression that can happen. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the, the Dukananas. Um, would you say, and, and, and you touched on this uh, the, briefly, but the fact that these spiritual traditions that have, you know, thousands of years of meditation within them actually have um, records, teachings, descriptions of negative things that can happen to you from meditation. And is that correct? So sort of working within these traditions, you know, the teacher can be trained in a religious sense to deal with some of these bad side effects slash perhaps look them up in a scripture slash expect them am, am i am i am i right in in this um yeah yeah absolutely so i think you just think of it as troubleshooting i think that these traditions you know there's there's so much knowledge contained in these traditions and that when these um situations arise a teacher knows how to deal with them um you know how to avoid them how to stop them from escalating um into something worse um, and you see it across a variety of traditions. So in the book, I talk about, obviously, Theravada, you've got the Dukananas, but that's seen as just an expected, um, you know, stage on the path to enlightenment. So it's not seen as something necessarily negative. Um, it could be interpreted as negative if someone is not expecting it and, you know, and, and goes through that stage. Um, and then you've got in Zen Buddhism, so you've got makyo, which is um, diabolical phenomena that can happen. So people can have hallucinations or hear voices. Um, and then in Tibetan Buddhism, you have a condition called lung, which um, is a result of imbalanced practice, and that can manifest in, in all sorts of symptoms. So um, there's a really interesting book that I refer to um, called Buddhism and Medicine. And, um, you know, unfortunately, because of the scope of my research, I didn't have time to really delve as deeply into this topic as I would have liked to. But um, if anyone's interested, it's called Buddhism and Medicine by Eric Green. And, you know, in it, he talks about how meditation was always seen as a, a high risk, but high reward practice um, and that it could harm or heal. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the book goes into a, a lot of detail regarding these issues. Do you think uh, it's, it's my understanding uh, that the emphasis on meditation uh, when we think about Buddhism and Hinduism in the West isn't necessarily there in the traditions. And, and you already touched on this, saying the words Buddhism and saying the words Hinduism aren't always helpful because these are uh, very large uh, traditions that have lots of sex and variety within them, but <laughs> I'll do my best. That mm. that we really associate these, these faiths with meditation, right? That is sort of the cliche. If you, I don't know, if you did a word cloud or asked someone to, to to say what you associate with Buddhism, right? They're, they're going to say meditation. And the first thing that's going to pop into a lot of people's minds when you say Buddhism is is a, a serene person meditating under a tree. But but it's my understanding that, that meditation was uh, in many of these communities in many eras, more of something that was done by renunciants or done by mm -hmm. monks and nuns, not not yeah. day to day normal people. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And that was something that really surprised me as well, because going into this research, I just assumed that, um, you know, meditation was the heart of some of these Eastern religious traditions. But um, it, yeah, so only a very small number of monks even would meditate. So the, the rest would be, um, you know, scholars or working on attaining merit. Um, so that's the first thing, even amongst ascetics, it's not like everyone meditated. It was a, you know, a small group of people. And certainly people in the lay community did not generally meditate. And when they did, it was traced to, um, you know, historical conditions that, um, so the two that I talk about, or, or one in particular that I talk about in the book is kind of the democratization of the Vipassana technique with Lady Sayadaw. And that was, um, you know, in response to colonial threat. So the idea was to get as many people as possible meditating and achieving enlightenment in a shorter period of time. Um, but it was, you know, due to political pressures. So it certainly wasn't about um, trying to reduce stress or, you know, heal a, a mental health condition. Yes. And do you think that perhaps, you know, some of the, the bad side effects of meditation might, might actually be coming out of the fact that 
some of these techniques were made for for renunciants in that you can do nothing but meditate all day and you don't have to worry about your wife your job or even where your food is coming from right that, that mm. is you don't have much in the life of a monk but the sort of the trade off is supposed to be you don't you, you don't have nothing to lose you don't have anything to worry about so you know taking taking these these techniques which are also meant to break all of your connections to the world right because yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. that's what renunciants do and you don't have any worries like we do of our nine to five jobs do you think that might also perhaps be a factor in some of these bad side effects yeah definitely i mean i think um so one of the things that um willoughby talks about in her research too is that something that can happen for people is that their emotions can become dampened down so mm -hmm. people can feel too disconnected from their loved ones or their daily lives they can feel unmotivated lose ambition um and I mean, that's not surprising if you're spending a lot of time cultivating non-attachment, right? right. <laughs> so, yes. yeah, yeah, I think context plays a huge role. Um, I mean, there are just so many possible effects from meditation, and I think it's just such a, a complicated web, but that could definitely be one of them. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more, and, and again, you touched on this, but it's such a fascinating topic, uh, about self and, and not self, and how the different approaches to the self in Eastern religion and Western psychology, like these might lead to the problems or adverse effects in so-called secular meditation? Yeah, sure. So, um, so in secular meditation, um, as we were talking about earlier, the, the goal is um, symptom relief or self-improvement or transformation. And the idea is to kind of, you know, heal or better the small psychological self. Whereas in these traditions, um, suffering is seen as, um, you know, being caused by this this illusion that we have a psychological self. And, and the idea is to transcend this you know, idea of the identity self and realize non-self or in Hinduism, true self. Um, so I think, you know, so, uh, this is a really interesting question. And I think this is where future research needs to go, which is exploring this idea of what changes can we expect to our sense of self when we meditate? Um, so someone might be coming into meditation with the goal to reduce stress or, um, you know, improve focus or concentration, and they're not necessarily expecting to have these significant changes in their sense of self. Um, so what Willoughby's research has shown is that um, meditation can have significant changes to sense of self. And when we talk about sense of self, we also have to really drill down into um, you know, the various aspects that make up our sense of self. So this could be our narrative self. Um, it could be our sense of embodiment or agency. Um, it could just be our sense of a basic self, um, you know, the sense of existing. And so research has demonstrated that meditation can affect um, how people experience their sense of self. And again, in a tradition where this is the goal, this could be seen as really liberating. Um, but for people who might come in from a secular perspective, just wanting a bit of stress relief, having these significant challenges to how they view themselves, um, you know, can be really challenging and for some people um, unexpected and undesirable. Yes. Um, going back to the idea that meditation is a cure-all, right? A panacea. Mm. So we did discuss that, but we didn't discuss where did that idea come from? Like, why is it so prevalent? Yeah, this is something that I'm really obsessed with, which is this idea of um, the power of the mind to cure disease. And I think, I mean, this is a conversation that could go down a, a whole other track um, because it informs a lot of my research. But um, we find that throughout history, there have been groups of people who believe that all disease has its origins in the mind. Um, so in, in the West, we had the mind cure movement in the 19th century. Um, so this was a movement founded by Phineas Quimby, and it inspired um, other movements such as Christian science and New Thought. So, um, you know, Christian scientists believe that sickness is an illusion that can be cured by prayer. Um, people who ascribe to, the, to New Thought beliefs think that, you know, if you can just get your thinking right, then this will have a healing effect on the body. Um, so I think that 
it can be traced back to those meditation in the West, our idea of it as, you know, a panacea or a cure-all can be traced back to these original movements. And there's a really great book called Mind Cure, um, which traces the history of this. And then I think, you know, we had um, the, the two big um, influences were definitely John Kabat-Zinn and MBSR and this idea that, you know, medicine, uh, sorry, meditation can move into the clinical domain and then TM and all of the scientific studies around that. So I think that, yeah, that there are lots of factors that influence that, but they're, they're the main ones. Um, and then the, the other thing is, I think that we have, you know, this disenchantment with Western medicine. So, um, you know, a, a lot of diseases are not curable or we have to take medications that have really awful side effects. And I think that, you know, techniques like meditation offer a lot of hope for people that, you know, maybe there's an alternative path. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So if it's not a cure-all, what does the science seem to say about the positive effects of mindfulness and meditation? Like what, what does it cure? Yeah. So, um, I mean, this is not my area specifically, but um, there are some review studies that have looked at the effects, the actual um, clinical effects of meditation. And, you know, there's been concern that some of the, the studies have not been particularly well designed or, um, you know, have, have not, um, have had problematic experimental designs. Um, but what I think in general it has shown that meditation does have benefits for some conditions um, and these benefits are relatively moderate. So again, getting back to that bell curve, it's probably giving you know people a, a moderate amount of relief and then there's probably people who where it does nothing and there will be other people where it's you know exceptional. Right, right. Well, we're starting to get through all the questions and uh, I, I've definitely learned a lot, Anna, so thanks so much. So we're, we're starting to get into wrap up. But uh, before before we go there, Jason, do you have uh, follow up questions, ending questions, uh, uh, thoughts you want to share? Yeah, well, I guess uh, there, there's one thing um, th this might have been either obvious or or stated uh, already stated, but differently elsewhere. But like is is uh, like w w one thing that this whole subject has kind of made me consider is that that like without an awareness of of some of the like uh, what can happen around not self um, and just what can happen when you follow certain uh, uh, stock assumptions of what meditation is that mm. that you might be walking into uh, a pothole and not knowing it kind of thing. Um, so I guess maybe is there it, like uh, I guess the the question is is that like what would you say like just in a in a sort of in a summary kind of mode what are some of those like potholes key people can be walking into without knowing uh, like without having that um, uh, without having the tradition of where meditation came from yeah. to help them along. Um, good question. Potholes. Um... Look, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, this all comes down to informed consent. And I'm a big believer that people just need to know what they're getting into. So, um, you know, I think that with the the rush to secularize meditation, um, there is, you know, at, the, at its extreme, there's been a tendency to... Um, you know, to really distance it from religion to the extent that I think it, it might be... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, like, not untruthful, but um, help me out here. Um, like that it's I'm really th stuck. Th there's like a um, uh, th there are some um, uh, supports maybe that are that are part of a tradition that if you take the tradition away, those supports are also gone. Yeah, well, and I think also just this idea that you're. Um, kind of selling something that's that's not entirely um you know you're not being transparent that's the word i'm looking for like there's mm. there's a lack of transparency around where these techniques come from and i think that people that's important for a couple of reasons like firstly for some people it's it's not going to bother them that meditation a technique might have originated with a specific eastern tradition but for some people who are committed to another religious path um or who you know view themselves as atheists they like that might be important for them to know that um 
And then I just think there has to be informed consent around people knowing what sort of changes they might expect um, from the technique. Um, it's, you know, it's realistic expectations, it's limitations and, you know, in any potential risks. And I don't think the risks are, are hugely high, but um, I think that it's it's really important to manage people's expectations around the, around the benefits as well. So you don't want to have people, you know, like John was saying before, experiencing this extreme disappointment if things don't work out and, and blaming themselves. Uh, and speaking as somebody who's felt that disappointment, <laughs> um, yeah, quite keenly, like that, I, yeah, that I'm doing it wrong. I'm not good at this. Uh, my my brain's not good at this. That kind of feeling. Um, yeah. Uh, um, and and yeah, like I mean, I I have some meditation tools, and I have people like like John in my life to uh, to to reference. But uh, but even then, I know that I'm not really operating. I'm not like uh, John isn't formally training me. I'm not part of a of a formal group. So I, I do feel like this really speaks to me about maybe uh, informing my own consent <laughs> with what yeah. I'm doing to myself, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just not expecting that meditation is necessarily going to solve all your problems. So I think mm -hmm. that there's an idea amongst certain groups that um, if you can just, you know, get to this realization or, or awakening that all of a sudden all of your mundane worldly problems are going to be solved. And mm -hmm. um, I don't yet know of anyone where that's been the case, <laughs> but you might know different. Um, so yeah, I think just managing expectations, um, informing people regarding what they can expect and what sort of outcomes they can expect. Um, and also providing a supportive context and knowing when to refer as a teacher, knowing when you know, someone's having a difficulty that is beyond your capacity to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, now, my next, I've got a, another question. It's unrelated to the first one. And it, this one actually might go more to Jonathan first. Um, uh, but because we are talk gnosis <laughs> and the, like the whole idea of no, Gnosticism and, and Gnosis and, and the usefulness here, uh, and is that like a, a lot of, I think, why we're talking to you is because meditation comes up a lot in the in the esoteric traditions that are often mm. associated with Gnosticism. Yeah. And there's also like a mindful Christian practice as well that like, yeah. um, uh, and I think a lot of people practicing in those traditions can benefit from a lot of our conversation here. But uh, also the, th the, the thought that I had while we were talking was that like one of the most concise descriptions of Gnosticism that I've ever heard that I really appreciate was that uh, is that it's it's a um, uh, an act of of remembering that the world do, like isn't like this or doesn't have to be like this. It's mm -hmm. a moment of like it's a it's an aha moment, uh, um, a a, re a revelation in a way, but it's it's in a way very simple. Um, and uh, is that is that also kind of connected? I think to this this notion of the dark night of the soul that like where you're sort of crossing this process of realizing that a lot of what you, the you that sat down and the you that is maybe sitting there breathing about about what you're doing are kind of having this moment of, of remembrance. Is that kind of a thing here, John? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd say two things to that. One, as, as, as Anna talked about, when, when we say dark night of the soul, it, it's not just the there's actually a lot of communities using the term now <laughs> so it's 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 defining it and and understanding it uh I, I think is important and you know i used a phrase but i actually haven't done a deep dive into saint john of the cross right mm -hmm. um so i'm actually trying to get out of the habit of of specifically using the phrase so that it does have a tighter meaning but to make a long story short jason uh, I would say, like, yes. You know, I, I think that would be, if not part of the dark night of the soul, then then part of this this darkness and this negativity, or what we as encounter as darkness and negativity uh, on the on the journey. Yeah, mm. does that does that make sense? <laughs> what yeah. do you think, Anna? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that there can also be a sort of mourning of the loss of the sense of conventional self. And, um, yeah. you know, people sometimes describe like seeing something that they then can't unsee. And, you know, it, it's challenging to their values um, and the way that they've, you know, built up their sense of self in the world. So I think that that could definitely be a part of it. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and really, uh, Anna and Jason, like well, what Anna was just talking about, specifically that process, a lot of Christian contemplation would actually, I wouldn't say all of it. And of course, there's different systems of Christian contemplation and different teachers, and different ways of looking at it. But that experience is actually sort of synced up with or understood symbolically through the crucifixion. <laughs> because you are like it, it's it's it feels like you're killing yourself right or like mm-hmm. or that part of you is dying and that you're suffering mm-hmm. uh like, like anna was saying because you know you are looking at uh yourself in, in a whole new way and understanding the self in a whole new way and seeing some parts that um i'm trying to find some some terminology that's that that's not too rigid but yeah like uh the, the yeah so that's it can be very unpleasant. <laughs> but in the Christian context, if you're going to map on the Christian, you know, symbolism, then, you know, hopefully at the end of the process, what comes after the crucifixion is the resurrection of a new self, right? Yeah. But uh, I, I specifically bring up the crucifixion because, you know, that's that's how that's how painful the process can yeah. feel to some people. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, well, well, I guess that's about it. Uh, but of course, Anna, uh, can you tell us about the book? I'll bring the title up here on the screen for everybody. Yep, so th- the book is called The Dark Side of Dharma, Meditation, Madness, and Other Maladies in the Contemplative Path. Um, and it sh- it's available on Amazon and, and other booksellers. Um, and I hope it's of great value to people and um, their meditation practice. Great. And if people want to find you online, I have your homepage uh, queued up here for those who are watching. But uh, for those listening, where can they find you online? Um, yeah, they can find me on my website, com, And I also try and post um, all of my academic papers on academia. Um, so you can have a look at my research there. Um, I am on Twitter sometimes. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the main places. Great. And uh, I'll do my closing plugs, which is ironically mileandmeditation.substack.com. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm doing some MBSR training and uh, looking to get more experience uh, just meditating with people and giving instruction. So uh, we do that uh, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. It's free, it's chill, uh, and uh, it's online for at least the time being as, as we're still pretty locked down in Montreal. So feel free to check that out and I will do my best to create a safe space and to uh, make sure that you give informed consent. <laughs> and we, I'm also available for, for chat before and after those sessions so uh, I hope that I can uh, apply everything that is in Anna's book to make sure that you have a great experience as a meditator so hey, I have that hey, Jonathan and, yeah quick thing uh, do you want to just define MBSR for uh, any meditation newbies oh sorry it's a mindfulness-based stress reduction Great. So, and uh, Anna was mentioning John Kabat-Zinn. That's his very precise, um, uh, uh, I, really it's a course, but that the precise school of mindfulness, would, would that be right, Anna, would you say? Um, yeah, that's... I mean, it's a, it's a very specific technique. That, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 very specific and very precise in in its setup. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm just here to make sure that that uh, people like me who are still learning the acronyms uh, can can get at least one version of them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jason. And please keep doing that as well as unfamiliar terms, which can be thrown around on this show by all sorts of people in all sorts of contexts. <laughs> so, uh, Jason, do you do you have any plugs? Uh, nothing, uh, nothing, uh, seriously active. I run a theater company called Sage Theater here in Calgary, Alberta, um, uh, sagetheater.com. If you want to check that out, uh, we're going to have an arts festival running in the end of June here. That'll be entirely online. So wherever you're listening to it, you can, wherever you're listening to this, rather, you can probably watch our work here in June. Um, uh, not related to Gnosticism at all, at least not probably. I haven't seen all the submissions yet. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's what I do. Fantastic. Um, and then one final plug is uh, joanite.org slash conclave. Uh, the Gnostic community that Jason and I are both in does a, a yearly conference that's usually in person. It's always great. It's, it's a mix of a uh, really eclectic, interesting mix of speakers and workshops and great times to you know, make connections if you have interest in Gnosticism or esotericism. It's open to everyone. You know, there's no 
like it's it's a good time with interesting topics and you can sign up you can come and you know we're not going to try to convert you or make you believe things that you don't want to believe or anything else so uh this is a, a unique um opportunity to check out the conclave as it is usually in person it usually moves around from city to city to to different uh uh joe and i communities so this year it, it is going to be online for possibly the first and possibly the last time ever so uh i i if you like this show or you even have a mild interest in esotericism gnosticism western religion mysticism meditation or contemplation i'd highly recommend checking that out it's in may and the registrations are open now and you can go to choanite.org slash conclave okay well this is uh jonathan sword uh saying goodbye and thank you again anna it's been amazing thank you so much for having me okay. bye